I get a pretty big charge out of watching kids open up presents. I don't know about you. Um, they got to at least be able to talk, though, before it starts to get humorous. Um, I saw a video one time when you have, uh, where there was a child that opened up a gift, and he was so excited until he saw what it was, and his face just drops, and he goes, close! <laughs> I've seen others where, where they're jumping up and down and running around and like it's the best day ever in their life and hilarious also just to another level. Um, I think all of us, we, we, even as adults, we show our gratitude, show our value of a gift, um, ultimately really by how much we use it, I would say. Um, if it's not used much, uh, unless that's the nature of the gift, then it's a different story, but Really, if we just kind of put it off to the side, we show that we really don't put a whole lot of value on it. Um, whereas if we do use it quite a bit, then I think that shows that we do value it quite a bit. And on that note, that kind of brings us into our passage here today. Um, we're going to look at two accounts um, in Exodus 18, which further expose the identity of both Yahweh, who is God, and Israel also. And ever since the Red Sea incident, since Moses' song in Exodus 15, we've seen, well, let me back up. There are four accounts after that to take us through the identity of who Yahweh is and who Israel is or who they're supposed to be. So two weeks ago, we saw the first of the four, where Israel, we saw, was a long way off from where they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be more God-centered, and that was seen most clearly in Abraham. But they had more Egypt in them than they had Abraham's likeness. So there's still a long way to go. We also saw in that same passage that uh, God was their provider, um, that he gives them daily provisions, seen in the manna provisions in the desert, and also the water that came from the rock, and also even the bitter water that he turned into good water. So he's a daily provider. And then we also, then last week, is the second of these four events of identity, that we saw that by covenant, God is unified with Israel, and he is their strength. He's the one that makes their name great, as opposed to the people of the world who try to make their name great by themselves, apart from God. It's a very strong element of submission that was in there last week. If that wasn't picked up, it was for us to come back to a God-centeredness as opposed to self-centeredness which is what the corruption of this world has taken us to, into being self-centered more than God-centered. God is trying to bring them back into that place of how we were intended to be from the beginning. So today is the third of these four identity teachings, I guess you could say. Um, and the first one is starting off in Exodus 18. Uh, this is where Jethro ends up coming into the picture. So Jethro hears about all that Yahweh had done. Verse 1, Jethro, which his name means excellence or abundance, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he had said, God, the God of my father, was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming with to you with your wife and your two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. When Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the hardship that had come upon them in the way or on their journey, and how the Lord had delivered them. I have a picture of a, a tent, which would be more of a, like kind of a community, more of a tent of, of what it would have looked like at that time. Uh, this is more of a picture. Uh, more Currently, which kind of gives you an idea of that. When, when Zipporah was sent home with her two sons in the Exodus account is not 
given here, nor is it important. And that's something that we need to always remember when reading scripture, is that often we come across just selections of information. We're like, I would love to get more information here. But it's not, what this is, yes, it is a historical account, accurate historical account, but God is selecting certain things and he's highlighting this is what's important for you to understand how I'm bringing salvation back into this world. So it's not important is what I'm basically getting at, not at least for the message that God has given us. So we don't have that here. What we do have, though, is his two sons' names, Gershom and Eliezer. Gershom means exile or sojourner. Eliezer means God is my help. Both of them remind us where Moses has been and where Israel has been. And that's important. As we're going to see, this, this whole section is also reminding us back to the beginning of the Exodus account. It's interesting that these two sons were named. But Pharaoh, none of the Pharaohs were ever named in the Exodus. What you would think this world would say is obviously one of the most powerful men in the world. But yet, his name was never given. None of the Pharaohs. So the word of Yahweh, his victory over Egypt, has spread even to Jethro's ears. But unlike the nations who tremble at the news, like in Moses' song that we heard in chapter 15, that they hear and tremble in fear and run, uh, Jethro's actually attracted to it. So in chapter 4 of Exodus, we go back to the beginning, or towards the beginning of the story, after the burning bush incident, Moses asked Jethro for permission to go back to Egypt, and Jethro gives him his blessing. He says, go in peace. Peace is shalom. Most of you are probably familiar with that. It's a Hebrew word, pretty familiar, pretty common one. Shalom is peace. Um, and in verse 7 of our scripture passage, it says that they asked each other their welfare. It's the same word, their shalom. Asked each other their shalom. Asked them their peace. So therefore, um, what peace means, the noun version of it is, is well-being, health, harmony, safety, a state of calm without anxiety or stress or conflict often expresses the blessings of the Lord. It's the result, it's the fruit of righteousness. It's the opposite of chaos, toil, and pain. Peace also indicates reconciliation between two parties. In Isaiah 9, uh, verse 6 and 7, it says peace is what the Messiah will bring with him. In fact, the Messiah is actually called, just the verse before this, the Prince of Peace. Peace is often personified as wisdom in the Proverbs. And Jesus is also personified as wisdom in the New Testament. And he brings peace with him. It's interesting that last week we also had a reference to Melchizedek, who was the priest in Genesis 14 that Abraham ends up encountering after he rescues Lot. And his very name means Prince of Peace as well. It's meant to remind us back to the Melchizedek occurrence. Also, Exodus 4. In that account, we saw Aaron come into the picture where he goes after the burning bush incident with Moses. He goes to the mountain of God, it says, just like Jethro comes. And Moses kisses him and greets him and tells him all that the Lord had done and said, just like he did with Jethro in our account that we just read. It's to show that full circle is coming back. Because in Exodus 3.12, God says to him, says to Moses at the burning bush, he says, this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. You will come back here. And this is exactly what it's highlighted and saying. Remember what happened. All of these things coming full circle. Ultimately, it's saying God's word is trustworthy. Again, another element of proof that God's word is trustworthy. So, continuing with our passage. And Jethro realized, or rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel in that he had delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. The most important phrase of this whole scripture passage. Because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. 
And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses, his father-in-law, before God. We're starting to see that God has a bigger plan than just for Israel. His work in Israel is for the nations to hear about him, to know about him. In fact, in Romans 11, verse 11 through 24, we see that the Gentiles are grafted in to the root of the olive tree, which is Israel. The branches are broken off, those that are of, un, of no faith, basically. And the Gentiles are starting to be grafted in. But there's also a warning that you be of faith, or you could have your branches broken off as well. Be of faith. But that's been the plan for God from the whole beginning, is, is that Israel has been the, the vehicle of revelation God's people have always been the ones that, that's always been the plan from the very beginning to, to work through them and to be a blessing to the whole world of what his plan for salvation is for all of humanity. So has Jethro become a follower of Yahweh? Maybe. Sure seems that way. Sure seems that he's all of a sudden being pretty, pretty convinced that, uh, well, he says, I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. That is a very important statement, especially considering that Israel just left Egypt that has hundreds if not thousands of gods. And they seem like they're very blessed, right? Gold everywhere, all kinds of incredible things that show that they are very blessed. But Jethro here points something out, which should be obvious to everyone, and that is, no one is like Yahweh. No one. There are no gods like him. He's above them all. God says of Pharaoh in Exodus 9.16, But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Proclaimed, the same word for that Hebrew is used in our verse 8, where Moses told Jethro's father-in-law all that God had done. Proclaimed it to him. Also, Coming back to the Melchizedek incident here, I tried to highlight basically the similar incidences. In Genesis 14, we see the Melchizedek incident of what he says in the blessings. Jethro and what he says here is in Exodus 18. First of all, these two are priests. Both of these, both Jethro and Melchizedek are priests. Both of them also are highlighted as eating a meal with the main person in Melchizedek. It's Abraham. With Jethro, it's Moses. And also, both of them praise God. But here we see Melchizedek says, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Jethro says, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. What's interesting here is this. God Most High, three names for God, the first and the last are identical. Over here, Three names for Egypt, first and the last are identical. You have two deliverance mentions, one deliverance mention. Two blessings, one blessing. These are absolutely showing that this is supposed to bring us back. These two items are linked. Absolutely, but they're different also at the same point. Here, God is doing a deliverance, saving his people out of something, out of oppression. Here, Abraham is a blessing to the world. He is light to the world. God is the centerpiece of it all. Three names right there in completion. Here, the Egyptians are the centerpiece and the problem that are here. The point is that God is taking them from here. They're supposed to be over here. He saves them to bring them to be light in the world, as Abraham was. Interesting that outsiders seem to be more impacted by these events than Israel is, at least so far. In Exodus 2.20, Moses eats bread with Jethro, the priest of Midian, after saving Jethro's daughters and flocks at the well from the shepherds. Remember when he left Egypt, and he comes to the well, and his, Jethro's daughters are basically being bullied by these shepherds, so he ends up saving them. And that's where he comes then. He's invited to come and eat bread with Jethro. Here, we see Moses again eats bread with Jethro. But this time, it's with Moses' family. The focus is with Aaron and the elders of Israel. 
And both of them are right before Moses has an encounter on Mount Sinai with Yahweh. So therefore, this is telling us family, celebration, community, fellowship, and peace. All of these are linked together, telling others of the salvation of God, witnessing. It's extremely important. Times of eating are still moments of fellowship and community and sharing life, conversation. I've heard just for this week, it's funny that this came up because just this week I was uh, in conversation being told that this church at one point was big on dinners and community and, and all of that. And it's okay, don't get upset or, or that we, we don't do it as much. Hopefully, praise God, we'll do it again. And we'll come back into that. But that is exactly what is going on here, is that that community then, the sharing of the ways that God has worked in our lives. We've been illuminated as his people to the path of peace with God. But a lot of times being different, talking about God in this day, this world, makes us stand out. Being odd. And we don't want to be odd. We want to be just like everyone else. We don't want to stand out. And unfortunately, that gift that's been given to us then gets snuffed. We are to share what God has done for us. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We're supposed to stand out. These are gifts that He's given us. We need to let others hear the works that God has done in our lives. So the next section, Yahweh gives Moses a human hand. Jethro sees what Moses is doing. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning until evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw that all that he was doing, for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? And all the people stand around you from morning to evening. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a dispute and come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws, Moses' his father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. It's interesting that in Exodus 2.14, if we remember at the beginning of the whole account, an Israelite said to Moses, who made you prince and judge over us after he killed the Egyptian? Are you going to kill us too? And from that, Moses realized he needed to run. Interesting that now he is judge. And they come to him for advice and judgment and the will of God. Question here stands, how could Moses have known God's laws before going up on Mount Sinai? He's teaching the people the laws of God, and he still hasn't even got the Ten Commandments yet. He has not gone up on Mount Sinai. So how could he be teaching the laws? Some theologians would say, well, that clearly shows that this is not in order and that, you know, later times they basically cut and pasted things. I just won't accept that. I will never accept that as being the way that things were written at all. Better to submissively come to the text and say, teach me what you're trying to tell me. And I think, it, I think there's a very, very simple explanation for this. Is this. Number one, it shows the fact that there is a need for God's laws to be written down officially for all people to see it before he goes up and gets that written account of everything. There is a need. He's got two million people to teach, basically. And Jethro sees, there's no way you're going to be able to handle this by your own. This is just ridiculous. What you're doing is not good. He's a priest. He knows how to teach people. He knows how to be able to, to minister to them. And he's a blessing to Moses. Also shows that Moses already understood God's law somewhat. How did he understand it? His likeness, his image. He already knew it. He's been working with God through the salvation of Egypt. And God's been talking to him and working through him. And what he's trying to do is show them. I guarantee you that a lot of what he was telling them was some very similar things of what they're already used to. If you studied the law of God and then also compare it to some of the things in the Middle East at that time, the laws are very similar, but there are some changes in them. And that's what Moses is teaching them. 
He's saying, this is the way that Yahweh is. This is what you've known. This is the same thing that Jesus does when he ends up coming as far as the Sermon on the Mount. This is what you've been told. But here's what I tell you. Exactly what Moses is doing. He's telling them, this is the likeness of God. The written law is to preserve its purity. That no matter how corrupt things might get from generation to generation, it's always there in its purity. Literally, at least for us to see and come back to it if needed. But it must be taught and lived. Written on the heart is the whole point. The circumcision of the heart is the, the, the thing that you see in the Old Testament. Same idea. It's not just a flesh of the heart. It's meant to be in our very inner being of who we are. To become part of us. Absorbed as our being. The relational knowledge is what's necessary. His character becomes our character. And we learn the trade of our Father by watching Him and living with Him, walking with Him daily. Just like Jesus says. I only do what the Father has shown me. He's talking about I'm the Son of God and I do exactly what the Father has taught me, just like they did back then. The Shema is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. It means here. And ultimately, it's, this is something that they, they memorized. And they recited at least twice a day. I'm sure you've heard it before. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Listen to how this is incorporated. It's supposed to be incorporated into your life. Everything that you do, the law is supposed to be going through your, the pores of your skin and everything that you do. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand as the work basically of your hand that all shall see and they shall be on frontlets on your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. They shall be your very identity. It shall be all that you are transformed by these things. Not just memorizing them should be your being, everything that you are. That's what the law is for. God's purpose has always been to make people who have an intimate knowledge of him, knowledge so that it can be reflected back to others, light in a dark world. And this is the first time that we see this after the Exodus account that God is doing this in Israel now. Now already you see that account with the patriarchs, but with Israel since Exodus is now it's starting to come around back to them. When Jethro says, why do you sit alone? It should remind us of Genesis 2, verse 18, when the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make for him a helper, fit for him, human help to one another, male and female. Have we noticed that we each have strengths and weaknesses? Often we can actually get perturbed because we're different from each other. But it's supposed to be that way. We're supposed to complement each other. We're supposed to be different so that if you have the same person able to do everything, then you got too much in the same place, basically. It's overkill. Same thing with the church. The church doesn't all have the same gifts. People have different gifts. That's what God gives to us to be able to strengthen us. But too often, we're so self-centered, even as Christians, that we're so focused on ourselves. Well, that bothers me. I don't like the way that that person is, the way that they dress, or the way that they talk, or what he said, or what she does, whatever the case is. We're annoyed because we're so internally self-centered, when actually we should be more looking at what a blessing that that is that that person fills that need in our place, in our church, or what a blessing that he or she is in our marriage to be able to be a complement to one another. What a blessing that the community is to fill the gaps of need as a community. To be strengthened in a world of darkness and poor and need. Again, it's been a plan from the beginning. Moses also, last week we saw in, in verse 12 of chapter 17, Moses sat alone on a stone. Or he sat on a stone, but he was not alone. Oh, didn't know it kind of thing here. Um, <laughs> He wasn't alone. He had Abraham, he had, sorry, uh, Aaron and her that were there to hold his hands up. But he also had God that was empowering him as well. 
God even told Moses in Exodus 3.12, right before he said, you will come back to this mountain. He starts the whole phrase with, I will be with you. And Moses says, I don't want to go back to Egypt. That's the last place I want to go. And God follows it up and says, but I'm going with you. You're not going alone. This is a great reminder for Moses and for us. Our need for God to be with us. But also our need for good community. Good community. Healthy community is what's important. So in verse 19, it says, Now obey my voice. This is Jethro speaking. And I will give you advice. And God shall be with you. And you shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands and hundreds of fifties and tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter then they decide for themselves, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you continually, and you will be able to endure it. And all of the people also will go to their place in peace. Jethro, Jethro's advice is extremely needed here. Extremely needed. It also returns the favor of Moses rescuing his daughters from the well. Jethro returns the favor, and both of these accounts increase the shepherding efforts. Moses helps out Jethro's shepherding efforts, and Jethro returns the favor back to Moses as well. Family, the benefits of a healthy community, helping one another in love. The verb which the name Yahweh comes from is used here over and over. Yahweh will be with you. It's the God that is with you, that exists with you. And, and Moses will be before God, representing the people. He will be their ambassador. <clears throat> he will be their ambassador so that they are represented before God. He knows who God is and teaches them carefully, his representatives basically, to the people so that they might know the way to walk the way of God is like this. And don't you just see that in there? Pick people that are just and that are able, who fear God, who are trustworthy and duplicate what you know. Let them judge and rule and share in your burden. This is what Adam and Eve were supposed to do from the very beginning, that they were supposed to be in God's likeness and represent God to all of creation as his ambassador. Image and likeness, coming back into it. Moses is being taught by a non-Israelite. But it is in the likeness of God, and Moses recognizes it. He recognizes it that it is wisdom, very intelligent wisdom. The result of this implementation is that God will direct them continually. Moses will be able to endure the heavy weight, and people will come into peace. Don't we all recognize that we are pretty finite creatures, that we aren't perfect? I think we've all figured that out by now. We should have figured that out by now. We need help. Can't do everything. God created us that way on purpose. That we need God, but we also need one another. Peace is the place where God's bringing his people. Taking them out of the toil, out of the chaos, and showing them the way back into his peace. That's the whole point of the Bible. That's the point of Revelation. And that is what Christ is talking about in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, when he says, All of you who are heavy laden and burdened, come to me, and I will give you rest. And he says, Rest for your very souls. He's talking about the rest, the peace, the shalom that God had promised from Genesis 3. That though you will live in toil and, and pain and anguish and so forth, I will come back for you and I will lead you into my peace. Jesus also had 12 disciples. He duplicated himself. The very same thing of what Moses is being taught here. So continuing. Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, hundreds, and fifties, and all of tens. And he judged all the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but in a small matter they decided themselves. And Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. 
marriage covenant, basically, that, that Moses has gone into with his father in law is, is just seen. Um, he's honored. Father like figure that he's listening to. This is represented in the fifth commandment honor your mother and father, implying also obedience to God. Point is this that we're not alone. We are in a community, and we're meant to be living in the likeness of God. Still, as his church, it's always been that way, supposed to be that way. I understand the church cannot always be like that. Um, in fact, I would say probably more often than not, it can be. I'm not, I take it back. Sometimes it can be hurtful. Sometimes it can be very helpful. It's meant to be helpful and healing. In his image means that it's meant to be supportive and helpful to one another. Healing to one another. To help where we're in need. Not to be thinking of pride and hiding our needs and where we're struggling, but to lay them before each other and say, I need help. And for the rest of the people to come around and help them in the ways that they are strengthened, in any way that they can. So, a few concluding points. Israel is to praise God and bring praise from the nations. We are to continually speak of the good that God has done for us and cherish his gifts. Each of, our, each of us, we have stories, contexts that we were born into, places that we have a life, a, a hand that's been dealt to us that we can't do anything about. How we play out that hand is what we can do about it. And that's what God invites us into. So often we think, I wish that I would have been born into whether it be better family or a better part of the world or, or whatever it is that I wish I didn't have to deal with these issues. We all have issues that we have to deal with. Everyone, and some of us have a lot more than others. And it's always easy to say, you know, I wish that I had something better. But here's the thing, this is this. God put us there for some reason. Stay with me here for a second. The best way to witness is for us to tell the story that God has given us. That God has shown us his peace somehow and pulled us through that place. Would you agree with me that you are more willing to listen to a person? For an example, let me say this. If a parent loses a child, hard for them to listen to a person that hasn't gone through something similar when they say, you know, I really feel for you or I understand where you're coming from. And what do they say? No, you don't. You have no idea. And you might know that they mean that they want to help. But their words really don't have a whole lot of hitting them. What about the person that says, I've been there. I know exactly how you feel. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. There's a girl, that uh, her name is Emily, that was part of my youth group uh, a number of years ago, and she lost her mother in a car accident. She was in the car. Her older sister was driving. Her mother was killed. The two girls survived. It was very difficult for them to live through that. On a mission trip, though, we had like 50-something teams of close to 10 people on each team for doing missionary work. And at the end of each day, we would talk about God's things. And I heard just that same day, an older um, a woman my age, basically, had said, uh, we, she was telling me about the church who had gone through a very tough struggle. They had a, a girl who lost her father, basically, pretty violently. And she was devastated by it. The church was devastated by it. I think he was even pastor, actually, is what it was. Um, and it was just it was extremely difficult for all of them. And they'd gone into a couple of years now where they were struggling big time with it, especially the girls. She was getting worse and worse. She had seen many professionals, many Christian uh, like pastors and, and other leaders and so forth that wasn't making any progress. And anything, she was getting worse. That day they came back, and these two stood up at God's settings and talking to all of us. And this girl ended up saying, <clears throat> for the first time in years, um, I actually found peace and healing in the situation. Why? Because God put these two girls on the same team. Out of around 500 people and 50-something teams, these two girls were put together. 
And one high school girl, able to speak into that place, brought healing into that place where all those professionals and other people could never reach this girl. But one person that had gone through it brought peace and healing and strength. We all have something. Whether we have de dealt with, whether it be alcoholism or drug abuse or abuse ourselves physically or sexually or whatever the case is, it's a dark world. Horrible things. But by you being saved by God, if we surrender it all and say, I forgive the person, the people, everything, I give it to God, take it, just heal me, bring me into some peace and strength. He does. And the point is now he can use you to speak to other people. Who better to speak into those situations than you? You are the angel that God sends into this world to bring light to them that he lives. For you to tell your story of how he worked in you and brought you out of that place. What, who has a better passion for that than you? You know the need. You know exactly what they're going through. It's interesting that Jesus was said that he, through his wounds we were healed. And I know that that has more of an eternal implication than, than us. But is it really so odd that when he saves us that we come into the similar likeness, that our own wounds actually bring healing to other people? Can, if we allow it to, if we step back and stop focusing so much on us, but more turn to God and say, take all of it and heal me. And he will. I'm not saying it's easy. It's far from easy. But he meets us there. And he does help heal us. And he does strengthen us. And that's how he uses us best to bring healing into this world. God is number one in our lives, how can we not overflow it? But idolatry does separate us from God. Idolatry is putting other things above God. And ultimately, what that's saying is, God, I know you're at work in my life, but leave me alone. I just want to be like everyone else. Can't I just blend in and be like everyone else? And what God's answer is, is no. <laughs> you can't. Not if you're going to be my child. If you're going to be my child, you're going to join me in my work to this dark place. You're going to help me bring healing to this place. I saved you for a purpose. To bring you close. Isaiah 1 through 5, especially chapter 3, it says that Yahweh, the God of hosts, is taking away from Jerusalem and Judah his support and supply because they trusted man more than God, idols more than Yahweh. They've stumbled and fallen because their speech and deeds are against the Lord in his glorious presence. We are to share what God has done for us. It gives you the power to witness. Two, and the final point, is that God's is the power of wisdom, the guidance and the peace. we already seen that he is the provider of what food, water, strength, ability. He also provides us the ability of saving us from ourselves, our own destruction. The things that can actually destroy ourselves. It's not limited by boundaries or outsiders. In fact, he will use them. He can and he will. But we need to also know what his image and likeness, likeness looks like so we're not deceived by things that aren't from him. The point of wisdom is to bring us into the peace of God, but we've got to be willing to walk with him. We're never alone, but we've got to also embrace this church and community thing. I know I'm out of time here, but I, I do just have to say this. This is so important. Church is not supposed to just be a social place. If we're more worried about hearing a happy sermon all the time, going home joyfully, we're missing the point. Most of the Bible addresses the darkness that's in this world. It's interesting to me that so often we can just pick the happy passages and focus in only in on those. When really what we're supposed to be doing, these passages, sometimes they might hurt. Sometimes they might hit places that are really, really tough for us. But they're supposed to bring healing to us. They're supposed to help us heal. They're supposed to help us and feed our spirit so that we actually come closer to God. That's what it's meant to do.
That's what it is. And are there great passages, happy passages, I should say? Yeah, of course there are. There are many of them. All of them. We're supposed to embrace all of this word. So let it feed us and empower us for witness. We must be being transformed. That's the key. If we're not being transformed, we are just like everyone else. So this is the way of the things that we're meant to be, purpose. May we recognize the gifts of God and praise Him for, to them for all whom He gives us, represented by the meal, fellowship, life, and action. So may our lives continually proclaim in action and words that there is no one like Yahweh. Amen? Amen.